Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. I am Adria Breyer, the Vice Chair of the Health and Medicine Committee. I would like to welcome all of our members, all of our listeners, and probably the hundreds of thousands of podcast listeners who have yet to be members who enjoy all of our programs. We are an organization dedicated as an open forum to the social good. Ideally, we are non-judgmental. We want everyone to hear everything there is about every topic, to have open views, so welcome. Please peruse our website. We have specialists and experts in every field. Membership is very inexpensive. It's crazy inexpensive, and it's a beautiful, beautiful gift. As we will have learned in these times where we're, many of us are locked into our homes and just beginning to get out, the best gift is the gift of connection. And the way to stay connected through the Commonwealth Club is to have at least one membership, have a Zoom with your friends and family or with your family around you, listen to one of our amazing speakers, and then have a dialogue, have a cocktail, have a cup of tea, have it over dinner. Give Commonwealth Club as a gift. Mother's Day, Father's Day, birthdays, this is the intellectual gift that keeps on giving all year long and it is limitless. It is my great pleasure today to introduce you to Dr. Lehman McHenry, who is an expert in his field. Dr. McHenry, thank you so much for making the time. I know that you're on a crazy lecture schedule. I know you're speaking to medical students everywhere. And I am really, really grateful that you are bringing your information to our audience, to our members, to our new members to come. Dr. McHenry is a specialist in medical ethics, physical, I'm sorry, philosophy of science and metaphysics. He's a professor, a lecturer, an author, um, a consultant to law firms. His, God, your expertise is quite extensive. If anybody wants to look you up, I'm not gonna take up your presentation time to go through three pages of credentials. I do, however, before I introduce you and ask you some questions, I want to read something to our audience. This, Dr. McHenry speaks to different medical schools and medical students, as well as residents and those who are graduating. At Temple University, Department of Psychiatry in Philadelphia, Dr. William Dubin invited him to speak. And here is Dr. Dubin's commentary to his residents. It's a teaching hospital. And Dr. McHenry's topic is critical appraisal of the medical literature. This is what Dr. Dubin said. Listen carefully, doctors. Listen carefully because this will make you a better doctor. You're being exposed to the manipulation of medicine by the pharmaceutical industry. And it's hard to understand this. It's hard to take this in. When you know how they operate behind the scenes, you'll make better judgments about treating patients. That was the context of his remark. And I know this because as a cancer consultant, I know our doctors are overwhelmed and the time they have with patients is limited. So they do a lot of their learning afterwards through pharmaceutical reps and whatever reading they can put into it. Unfortunately, that has a lot of bias to it, even as well-meaning as these incredible medical people are in treating their patients. Dr. McHenry is gonna address this issue, the illusion of evidence-based medicine because everyone likes to quote evidence-based medicine. And now you're gonna know a lot of the information behind the scenes. So in the future, you can make much more informed decisions. Dr. McHenry, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the Commonwealth Club of California. Before you proceed with your PowerPoint presentation, I would like to ask you how you became interested in this field. Well, Adria, first of all, I'd like to thank you and the Commonwealth Club for this invitation. It's a great honor to give this lecture at this prestigious venue. Um, I, curiously enough, I began my career in medical ethics 
in a complete accidental way. It was through surfing in Malibu, California, that I met a lawyer called Skip Murgatroyd. And uh, while we were waiting for waves, he was telling me about the work that he was doing uh, in terms of fighting pharmaceutical companies to keep them honest. And at one point, he just asked me to come into the law firm and read some documents and see what I thought about them. And thus began this whole career of consulting with the Baumhedland Law Firm and uh, developing a, um, a new specialty in medical ethics. Well, you must have been a little bit overwhelmed and perhaps disappointed because we've been raised to trust. And I appreciate that you wrote this book. So let, let us go forward with that. And oh, and by the way, this book is available on our website. It will probably become a Bible for doctors and it's also open to everyone to purchase. Please, Dr. McHenry, please proceed. All right, thank you, Ben. Um, so my topic today is the same as the title of the book, The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine. I've just changed the subtitle a little bit to Distorted Science in the Age of Big Pharma. And this book came about from consulting with the law firm of Baum, Hedlund, Aristi, and Goldman in Los Angeles, California, you might know of them in the Bay Area. They're famous for having defeated Monsanto in three important trials for um, their weed killer Roundup, which caused Nonge Hopkins lymphoma. Uh, that eventually resulted in a $10. billion settlement with Monsanto, now owned by Bayer. Uh, so getting back to the subject of today's lecture, um, when I began to consult with Baum Hedlund 17 years ago, I connected up with a psychiatrist in Australia called John Duradini, and we worked on these cases together for many years and wrote papers together, and it was an uphill battle to get these published in the medical journals. And finally, this all came together in the book that I'm talking about today. So I want to give you some a little bit of a roadmap of what I'm going to do today, an outline uh, to tell you what's ahead of us here. First of all, there's the problem. Um, state your problem clearly. Um, that was what philosopher Karl Popper always said. Do you have a real problem or a pseudo problem? In this case, I think I have a real problem. And it is, how is the integrity of science protected from commercial influences? Or more specifically, how is medicine protected from corruption by the pharmaceutical industry? And you're going to see that the answer to both of those questions is not very much. Our methodology was to look at the uh, documents that are produced in litigation to give us a behind the scenes picture of basically how you make sausages how medical information is originates through marketing departments and is there then disseminated ultimately to prescribing physicians and to patients. Uh, now, this, some of these documents I'm going to be showing you today, um, no, hardly anyone ever sees these, and certainly not doctors, but it seems to me that the doctors are the very people who need to see them. Then I'm going to talk about, very briefly, what is evidence-based medicine? Uh, and then how is it corrupted? I'm going to give you one good example of a corrupted pharmaceutical industry trial. And then if we have time, get into some solutions to the problem. So once again, the problem, very generally put, is about fake science in a post-truth world. How do we distinguish the genuine from the fake, especially when the fake is designed to be indistinguishable from the genuine. So these people are professionals that produce these um, medical journal articles and conference presentations and continuing medical education presentations. And uh, the, the problem, once again, is how do you sort of get to the bottom of this spin that's put on medical information, all for the sake of profit? The industry-sponsored clinical trials in which, uh, in which these uh, uh, the data are produced are actually owned by the companies themselves, and that's really one of the sources of the problem. 
90% of these trials are pharmaceutical industry sponsored. And one very important component of the um, fraudulent manipulation of information is something called ghostwriting. So ghostwriting is the pharmaceutical industry's dirty little secret. And we're going to talk about this quite a bit today as we go through uh, some of the details of this. And I show you some of these documents. The, this information eventually makes its way into clinical practice guidelines. And Dr. Giardini and I found that in examining these clinical practice guidelines, that they can say, contain the same distorted messages that appear in the medical journal articles. Another component of the problem is the role that academics play in becoming ornaments of industry. They're called key opinion leaders. And one of the big, big problems I see here is what we might call the privatization or the corporatization of the university. Um, Next is the problem of distorted research priorities and disease mongering. When we are put on drugs where the risk benefit um, analysis really doesn't um, satisfy the basic criterion of what your decision should be to be on the drug. And finally, the, the role that regulators play in this, uh, in many cases, failing to do their job. Now, what I have here is a, a flow chart that describes my problem uh, in a graphic way. And what you see here is, first of all, the funding source, which is the most important one. So when the pharmaceutical industry is in control of the funding source, um, they basically control how the data is disseminated and, and how it is spun through PR firms and ghostwriters and key opinion leaders, which you see on the top right-hand corner of this um, flowchart, then how all of that basically funnels down into standards, opinions, research studies, research agenda reviews, uh, finally into the body of evidence and the public discourse. Now, if we had a, a, what I would call an honest system here of science functioning with the highest integrity, uh, ba the left side of this flow chart would be the primary uh, manner in which things would function. We would begin with the science, creating the standards, opinions, and how that funnels into public discourse and the body of evidence. But what we really here have here is a scenario where there is distortion, which begins with the funding source and the spin that's put on the data from these um, industry executives. So a uh, Stanford historian called Robert Proctor has introduced a new term called agnotology, which I think is perfect for describing the problem that I'm dealing with here. It's the study of how disinformation and decoy research and public relations spin misdirects science. And this he traces to the tobacco industry in roughly the 1970s and 1980s. So agnotology is the study of the deliberate construction of ignorance. And as we said, it is uh, the tobacco industry that wrote the playbook for this, this strategy. And it has been adopted by the sugar industry, the chemical industry, and the pharmaceutical and medical device industries. So I pretty much sort of consider myself as, as, as an agnotologist of doing the sort of research that fundamentally exposes how ignorance and distortion is maintained in our society, specifically with regard to medicine. So now looking at the methodology that Dr. Giardini and I used, it's, it's to um, use these documents that are produced in litigation as a means of doing what we call a deconstruction of the clinical trials that are reported in the medical journals to show how the distortion and spin is disseminated to prescribing physicians. Uh, the doc, some of the documents I'm going to be showing you today we call hot docs. And these are documents that would be used in depositions or even at trial. So a super hot doc for example, would be one 
that would uh, be used at trial. Many of these documents, by the way, are been have been posted publicly on websites such as Healthy Skepticism and the Drug Industry Document Archive, DIDA, at the University of California, San Francisco. So I've worked very closely with DIDA to uh, funnel the documents that we get declassified and made public. Now, this is a very difficult process of releasing these documents because when Dr. Giardini and I work on a case, we sign a protective order and the protective order forbids us from releasing any of this information to the public. Now, what happens in most cases in litigation is that the cases settle and the documents disappear with the settlements. But the Bob Hedlund Law Firm fights to make sure that these documents are going to be released to the public. And I would say that our success rate here is maybe about 30 or 40 percent because the uh, most, most of the documents remain buried. Uh, the courts, however, make a judgment with respect to the defendant's claim to trade secrets against the public's right to know. So whenever there is a serious health implication involved in these documents uh, and where we're successful, we, we get the documents released into the public and, and that allows Dr. Giardini and I to do things like write medical journal articles and books like the one uh, that we presently have. So Dr. our method was- Dr. McHenry? Sure. May I ask you a question? We have a question. We have a question from our listeners, and it may not be applicable here, but I would like to put it on the table. There's a tremendous amount of controversy about what's happening with COVID, and what's actually in the corporate documents for the shots and vaccines. Um, is there any way to get that documentation? Is this something you'd ever? Ah, no, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question because um, as we move through this pandemic and all of the science that's been produced, what I find, at least in terms of the people who are working at the very top, uh, the researchers who are doing the, the, the work of uh, trying to determine what does the science tell us? We very often get nothing but contradictory results. You would think that we would get clearer as we move through this pandemic, more clarity towards um, you know, causes and treatments, but at the moment we're in the middle of it and it's very difficult to make much sense of it. A lot of the researchers are demanding access to the data that has been produced by the pharmaceutical companies that have produced vaccines, and they're not getting it. And so that's, that's a problem. Uh, what we really need here is to get to the source of the information and to have independent researchers analyze that data and see if they're getting the same conclusions that is being made public. And that, that's exactly what I'm gonna be showing you today as we move through the slides here with one of the studies. May I ask you to the points you've just made? Are the FDA and the CDC the ones who are supposed to provide that to the researchers? Or do we not have well, a law to protect us so that information is available to the public? You would hope so. But as I mentioned previously, remember that when the pharmaceutical companies conduct their research and they um, put their funding into this research, they own the data and they disseminate the data as they please. And you're gonna see that again as we move through uh, my presentation today. So that's a very good parallel to make here. Ooh. Thank you. So getting back to the methodology that Dr. Giardini and I used, we would begin by looking at the suspected medical journal articles, the ones where it looked like that there was some trickery going on, and we would then work backwards through the documents that were produced in litigation, uh, and these would be 
crucial documents like the study protocols that tell, tell the researchers uh, how to conduct the clinical trials, uh, what were the established uh, endpoints that were set for the study, and um, the final study reports, which were the, the reports of, of all of the uh, uh, data that was produced in the course of the conduct of the clinical trial, uh, and all of the email communications that went on between the investigators in the trial and the company executives. And very often it was what we would find is that in all of that information that was produced to us in litigation, it directly contradicted what was in the medical journal articles and what was eventually disseminated to the prescribing physicians. Now we could take on the topic of evidence-based medicine. Well, just exactly what is it? Uh, Evidence-based medicine is an epistemological hierarchy of reliability, uh, beginning with respected authorities, mechanistic reasonings, reports of committees at the bottom, all the way up to the apex of the triangle, which was the uh, randomized placebo-controlled trials. So evidence-based medicine has created what we might call a revolutionary paradigm in modern medicine. It's one of the greatest breakthroughs uh, in recent history. It, it was started in the 1990s by David Sackett and Gordon Gayak. Uh, revolutionized medicine in the sense that uh, it gave us a sort of strict sort of means of determining what evidence was most reliable and what evidence was least reliable. So if you look at uh, these three different levels of evidence, what you see at the very top, once again, is the evidence of randomized placebo-controlled trials. Then levels two, there are three different levels there, which are different kinds of what we might call observational studies, uh, comparative studies. And then down at the bottom is opinions of respected authorities, uh, what physicians were seeing in their clinical experience, reports of expert committees, and so forth. And there it is presented in a very simplified way, uh, where you see the, uh, how the evidence flows from the bottom to the top. Okay, so what evidence-based medicine did in many respects is show us that certain kinds of treatments or diagnostic techniques, which we believed to be uh, beneficial might turn out to be proved to be harmful once they're subjected to the methodology of evidence-based medicine, especially the randomized trials. But I think evidence-based medicine is simply an ideal. The reality is more like marketing-based medicine or spin-based medicine, which drug propaganda masquerades as genuine science. And the problem, once again, is that the pharmaceutical industries, the ones that are doing the testing of their own products are the ones that own the data, rather than having the scientific testing done by an independent body that has no financial interest in the outcome of the experiments. So the integrity of evidence-based medicine requires a disinterested independent testing, but the problem is the financial motive that is corrupting evidence-based medicine. So the basic argument of my book uh, is that evidence-based medicine depends on reliable data. Since, however, the data is largely, if not completely, controlled by the manufacturer of pharmaceuticals, the data are not reliable. Therefore, evidence-based medicine is an illusion. And the crisis of credibility is the subtitle of the, the book. The, the, the crisis of credibility is simply that Medical information that's passed on to physicians and patients is unreliable because it's difficult to determine whether it's coming from the marketing of side of the pharmaceutical industry or a genuine evaluation of scientific testing. And this infects the medical journals, continuing medical education, medical conferences. And in this country, we have direct-to-consumer advertising, which is also an enormous source of misinformation, if not disinformation. The trouble here 
is that in only two countries in the world, the United States and New Zealand, uh, direct-to-consumer advertising is permitted. And by the time the FDA catches on to the idea that, that they're misrepresenting the data, the damage has been done and the ad is removed from the television. May I? I'd like to make this really clear, um, Dr. McHenry. Are you saying in Europe, in most in Europe, they are not allowed to advertise pharmaceuticals to the general public? Correct. Uh, it's only two countries in the world where we have direct-to-consumer advertising. That sounds like a bit of a conflict of interest. And I'd like to make one point here. Our doctors are fantastic. If they are getting information that's biased, the only thing they can do is rely on that biased information. So perhaps somewhere along the way, you have an idea of how we can bring honest information, more honest information to those very caring individuals in the medical profession. And I'd like to make one other point. When we need our pharmaceuticals, we really need them. It seems like, from my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that when they do these drug trials, they do them in isolation. It's one drug or one prescription drug, then another prescription drug, and that they don't necessarily have studies on the interactions of them. So that people who are trusting these are then getting all kinds of side effects without having the knowledge and not the doctors. Is that correct? Well, that's especially important, especially when... Um, you know, you get into sort of uh, care of geriatrics and you've got people who are on anywhere between six to 12 different medications at once. And the drug interactions are very often the source of the problem. So I think you're quite right about that. Younger kids, I mean, I think teen suicide is on a a huge upswing yep. and a lot of them are depressed yep. and they wind up going on antidepressants, which is another important piece of your presentation. Yes. And we're coming right up to that in just a minute. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. Please go on. Right. So pardon me. Please go on. Yes. Jack. Um, so getting back to the illusion of evidence-based medicine Um, As I said, the reality is more like spin-based medicine or marketing-based medicine, given that message-driven models of public relations strategy become the standard against data-driven science. Uh, When drugs and medical devices are released into the market, the pharmaceutical companies hire PR companies and medical communications companies to launch their products by creating a need or an impression that the products are the latest miracles of scientific research, when in fact they're not. And ghostwriting, medical journal articles, is the major vehicle through which this strategy is accomplished. Richard Horton, who's the editor of The Lancet, has said in 2004 that medical journals have devolved into information laundering operations for the pharmaceutical industry. Now, that's um, pretty remarkable that the editor of one of the leading medical journals in the world has made that claim. If you think of um, money laundering, and Al Capone comes to mind as somebody where dirty money comes in and clean money comes out, And that's exactly what's happening with a great deal of these industry-sponsored journal articles. The dirty manuscripts come in, they go out as clean manuscripts as publications in the medical journals. Now, obviously, the dirty manuscripts are the ones where the data in the clinical trial has been distorted to represent a negative trial as positive. So when we boil this down, you see that the spin-based medicine is a result of the pharmaceutical industries testing their own products. The medical and the marketing departments working together produce the key marketing messages. The key marketing messages are then disseminated by the sales representatives and the key opinion leaders who are academics who are consulting for the pharmaceutical industry. The key opinion leaders start to look like expensive sales reps. Uh, And by the way, that's the legal loophole through which um, 
uh, off-label promotion occurs. So off-label promotion is, is illegal. It's when uh, drug companies promote a drug for some sort of treatment when they don't have a license for it. And all of this eventually funnels down into the dissemination of this information to prescribing doctors. Well, now we come to the question, which industry-sponsored trials are suspect? And my answer is all of them are, but we only have data from a very limited source of the ones that are corrupted, namely through litigation or government investigations. So here is a list of a number of scandals very recently in um, industry-conducted trials dealing with everything from psychiatric drugs uh, to drugs for diabetes, drugs for uh, uh, pain, um, hormone replacement therapy, all sorts of things. Uh, and the only reason why I selected these is, is, is because they are some of the ones that have played out in the media and uh, have had some of the most serious consequences. I'm going to focus on one today, just one, namely Paxil in the treatment of adolescent depression, which is uh, one of the uh, two trials that we investigate in my book. So in uh, the early 2000s, GlaxoSmithKline had a plan for Paxil or paroxetine, which was to gain a license for this drug for all of these different indications, major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety disorder, mood orders in women, mood orders in children and adolescents. Uh, so the plan was to, to turn Paxil into a panacea. And so we're looking in particular at um, how, they, how this played out for uh, depression in children and adolescents. So study 329 is now a famous trial because it was so fraudulently misrepresented the data of the trial. It was sponsored by GlaxoSmithKline. It was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial for eight weeks that tested Paxil against imipramine and placebo in 275 adolescents with major depressive disorder. The study was published in the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and there you see 22 names of some of the most well-respected names in child and adolescent psychiatry. This was in 2001. The paper became one of the most cited in the medical literature to support the use of antidepressants in child and adolescent depression. However, they didn't have a license. They were trying to get a license, remember? So all of this was done off-label. In 2002 alone, there were 2 million prescriptions for Paxil written for ch children and adolescents. The study was published under the, the lead author's name, Martin Keller and 22 others, and someone called Sally Layden, who is not included amongst the 22 authors, is listed in the fine print for editorial assistance. It turns out, however, that she was the person who actually wrote the article. She ghost wrote the article for a price of $17,250 via the contract with GlaxoSmithKline. Many of the named authors, those 22 named authors on that paper, made absolutely no contribution to that paper at all. Uh, only three or four of them met the criteria for authorship, even though that was very sort of dodgy from the beginning, given that the first draft of the manuscript and all the subsequent drafts were actually done by Sally Layden. And the role of the company that did this and in relation to GlaxoSmithKline was not acknowledged. So at one point, uh, the lawyer Skip Murgatroyd, who conducted the depositions in this case, one for the ghostwriter Sally Layden, asked her if she was asked by GlaxoSmithKline to put lipstick on that pig. She testified that she worked for my summary of the study report rather than the actual summary report or the data. So in other words, GlaxoSmithKline gave her a summary of the data from which she created the manuscript. And the authors, the so-called authors on this paper, uh, didn't even see the paper until she had produced it and GlaxoSmithKline had revised it. It was the intellectual property 
of GlaxoSmithKline. And here's a document right here, the first hot document I'm showing you, that shows that the manuscript was owned by GlaxoSmithKline, and it was released to the lead author of the paper so that he could submit it to the journal. Now, here's a letter from the lead author on the paper, Martin Keller, to the ghostwriter, Sally Layden, where he says, you did a superb job with this. Include, enclosed are just minor changes from me, Neil, and Mike, namely the first three lead authors on the paper. That's another hot doc. Here we see the website for the medical communication company that employed the ghostwriter that produced the manuscript. Now, this is very interesting because they're advertising themse themselves to their client, and what they claim that they do is to make the best possible use of print material to create and sustain awareness for a given concept, drug, group of drugs, using a fair, balanced approach that maximizes credibility. So here's behind the scenes how um, these journal articles are being mass produced by these companies called um, medical communications companies. Now this is another hot document. It is a memo to all of the sales reps that were selling Paxil to the doctors. And what it shows that they included the, a reprint of the Keller article, study 329, and look what it says. This cutting edge landmark study is the first to compare efficacy of an SSRI and a TCA with placebo in the treatment of major depression in adolescents. Paxil demonstrates remarkable efficacy and safety in the treatment of adolescent depression. So there you have the marketing hype, how it filters down to what is disseminated to the sales reps to then go out and detail the doctors with the reprints and, and encourage them to use this drug for children and adolescents with depression. Now we come to a super hot doc. This is what GlaxoSmithKline was saying internally about the, what they knew about their clinical trials. They had produced three trials, children and adolescents, and all three trials failed miserably to demonstrate efficacy. Notice that they say themselves, as you will note, the results of the studies are disappointing and that we did not reach statistical significance on the primary uh, endpoints in the trial. And thus, the data do not support a label claim for the treatment of adolescent depression. Um, this is written, an internal memo that's written in October 1998. Um, noting the comparative activities with Eli Lilly and Pfizer for the same indication, GSK's goal in this piece was to effectively manage the dissemination of these data in order to minimize any potential negative commercial impact. It would be commercially unacceptable to include a statement that efficacy had not been demonstrated as this would undermine the profile of paroxetine. So what they were saying was that they couldn't let this out into the public because it would undermine the credibility of their drug for the adult population if we knew that they had failed miserably to achieve efficacy in these clinical trials for children and adolescents. Now, when Martin Keller, the lead author of the paper, was deposed, he was asked, did you personally have an opportunity to review the raw data of study 329? So you would think that the lead author on the paper would have to guarantee the information that was published. The lead author of the paper would also be the principal investigator in the trial. Wouldn't the principal investigator in the trial have seen the raw data? And here is his answer. Well, you know, at the most primary level, those huge printouts that, you know, that list items by number by number, you know, item numbers and variable numbers that you don't even have words on them, I tend not to look at those. So he admitted that he had never seen the raw data himself. Yet, in the published article, each one of the authors had signed off on this, and it says each author had access to the data and signed off on the manuscript before it was submitted for publication. The major findings of study 329 were selective reporting, 
Outcome switches showed manipulation of the reporting of efficacy results. There were elephant doses of amipramine, 200 to 300 milligrams, which were designed to improve the adverse event profile of paroxetine. So here was a design flaw in the trial, which was you're comparing Paxil with another drug, amipramine, with placebo. So what they did to make the side effects profile of paroxetine look better was to use elephant doses of amipramine so that you would get a lot more adverse events on amipramine and it would make the side effects profile on paroxetine look better. There was incredible suicidal and self-injurious behaviors that were discovered. 11 on paroxetine, four on amipramine, two on placebo. However, the Keller paper actually reported only five suicidal behaviors on paroxetine, one on amipramine and one on placebo. So the data was completely misrepresented here. The suicidal bait behavior was misreported and concealed in the coding emotional lability. So one of the tricks here was the way that they hid the suicidal behavior was by using the coding term emotional lability, which covered everything from crying to suicidal gestures and behavior. Here's another super hot doc, and this one is written by Sally Layden, the ghostwriter for study 329. Now, this concerns another study, which was a panic disorder study. And it says that smith klein Beecham has canceled our project. The reason the side effect data analysis was terribly unfavorable to our favorite antidepressant. And we hate when this happens. Now, read down to the bottom again. Sally Layden says, there are some data that no amount of spin will fix. And these certainly fall into that category. So what does that tell you about study 329? 329, apparently they thought that there was some data that spin would fix for study 329, but not for study 322. Again, why were the stakes so high for study 329? It was because they were desperate to get that license for the drug for children and adolescents, and they could not undermine the profile of paroxetine for the adult population. So I'm going to use an analogy here. It's all like space junk. All of this stuff circling the globe that you can't get rid of, and that's what we, ba what we basically have with all these fraudulent medical journal articles. They're circling the earth. Uh, <laughs> you can't get rid of them. All of these miss all of this information that's still out there in the public domain and influencing prescribers' behavior. So Dr. Giardini and I did a study in 2010 of 184 medical journal articles that cited the Keller article. And what we found was 40% of those articles reproduced the false claims about the outcome of study 329, and 43% of them implied that study 329 was positive. Well, in the wake of all of this, there was first of all a black box warning that was placed on paroxetine for the use of children and adolescents because of all of the suicidality that emerged that was attributed to the drug. Uh, and eventually, GlaxoSmithKline was fined $3 billion. It was the largest fine in pharmaceutical history for um, off-label promotion or what they called misbranding of three drugs, which included Paxil. Dr. Giardini and I wrote to all of the um, named authors on the Keller paper, and we begged them, tell us what's wrong with our conclusions. Here is the paper we published. Tell us what's wrong or demand that this article be retracted. And we only got a response from one of, one of those authors who said that he was concerned and then he disappeared. We also wrote to the medical journal editor and demanded retraction of this article. Uh, she said that it was not the job of, of the journal to police authorship. And then when the editorship changed the next year, that editor said that there is nothing scientifically incorrect in the published Keller article. So study 329 in retrospect is one of the most infamous of corrupted trials in medicine. Um, and it only gained attention, I think, because of the 
shameless marketing of SSRIs in uh, children and adolescents, and because of all of that suicidality that came out of this years later. All of these co-conspirators maintain the status quo, the pharmaceutical and medical device companies, the medical communications companies, public relations firms, medical communications companies, the medical journals, academic key opinion leaders, universities, and finally, this wouldn't work if it weren't for prescribing physicians. Five prescribing physicians have to take the bait. It all depends on them. So I think industry science is an oxymoron. The pharmaceutical industries are not producing science. They are, I think, producing pseudoscience. So I'm going to skip right to the conclusions here because I think we're pressed on time, aren't we? Andrea? No, Dr. McHenry, let's let's this is phenomenal information. I want to clarify just a few points, please, and please don't rush through. Very good. One point is that the the doctors only know what they're learning from the reps. They only, and as well-intentioned as they may be, they do have a responsibility, as you said. Unfortunately, that is also compounded by, and I'm sorry to say this, by our government allowing pharmaceutical firms to market to the individuals, to the people in the outside, in the public. So they go back to their doctors and demand what they think is a solution, and then the doctor is put on the spot. So I think there's a mutual responsibility here, and I'd, I'd love to hear you comment on that. I have another comment. It, it actually hurts my heart because what we're looking at here is financial gain. Financial gain when there are yes. children and people involved. We are forgetting as much as we look at these facts or not forgetting because you were committed to bringing this information forward, with Dr. Giardini, that people, children, lives, families are impacted by financial gain. And we have apparently, even with just Paxil, which is the tip of the iceberg, this was off-label. Yep. It hadn't even been proven. So the sidestep here, again, from the audience is there, and I, that is mind-boggling on its own before you get to solutions, that we're forgetting that we have people here, living yes. human beings. So the question from the audience is, and it, it's going back to COVID because that's what's happening in the world today, that it's uh, the understanding that these trials from Moderna and Pfizer, the real trials, the human and animal trials, are not supposed to be over, let me read this, are not supposed to be over until 2023, yet these are being marketed as safe, safe and efficacious. Do you know anything about that? I don't know anything about that. Well, I, I sort of hesitate to, to go into that territory because I haven't okay. had access to the data, you know, and, and we haven't, haven't seen anything at all yet like we have here with study 329, you know, and you have to keep in mind, how long ago was this? This was 2001, you know, and it, and it took us about 12 years to put this story together and find out what actually happened. That's how long it takes. And so, again, we're right in the middle of the situation right now where the vaccines are being produced. And uh, this is emergency authorization only. This is not um, a situation where we've got a vaccines that have gone through the same process of phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials you know, over a long period of time. But even when we do that, even when we do that, look what we get. We get these fraudulently manipulated results. Uh, and it's only post-marketing years afterwards that we start to see these safety signals show up. Uh, so I am very much concerned about the long-term consequences here. But I, you know, but I hesitate to, to comment on that, not really having access to the data and not having access to all of the important communications that were going on that show us just exactly uh, how these how these vaccines came to be produced. I, I did not mean to, it was an audience question and I just needed to bring it yeah. forward. But because you brought up one other point, can you please make that distinction again, the difference between emergency use authorization and I guess the standard practice of true long-term yes. testing? Okay. 
Well, emergency youth authorization is is, is people releasing this vaccine to, for the, in the interest of of you know um, dealing with this pandemic, bringing the pandemic to an end, as opposed to the normal process, you know, of submitting um, many, many, many years of clinical trials to the FDA through this long approval process to get a license for the drug. Based on safety and efficacy? Allegedly. Okay. Well, I yeah. ideally, right, if they get through all the trials and they get approved. Ideally, yes. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for interrupting your presentation. Yes. I'm sure the person who asked that question got more information than they expected. So please yeah, go so on with your solutions. Um, one of the most brilliant ideas that's emerged recently is by a researcher at the University of Maryland called Dr. Peter Doshi. And he uh, initiated what's called the RIAT, Restoring Invisible and Abandoned Trials. I think it's one of the most promising developments to correct the scientific ref record, uh, especially given what I've just shown you. If successful, a reanalysis of a trial published in the journals offers a corrective to the published mis reported trial, whether or not it's been retracted. Okay, so notice, like the study 329, the Keller article is not retracted. It's still out there in the medical journals uh, as, as if it's a completely legitimate, sound piece of science. The RIAT reanalysis is an attempt to correct the scientific record by going after um, industry-sponsored clinical trials that are suspect. And the first step in this is to declare a call to action, to identify these trials that are, that are suspect, and then demand that the pharmaceutical companies turn over the raw data to a group of independent researchers to analyze the data and discover whether or not it was accurately reported. Now, this happened in the case of Study 329, and it only happened for one reason, and that is that there was a settlement agreement with uh, the state of New York. And the and settlement ag agreement demanded that GSK turn over all of the raw data from study 329 to this group of researchers. And this was published in the British Medical Journal in 2015. Now notice here, Here's the conclusion of the original Keller article in 2001. Paroxetine is generally well tolerated and effective for major depression in adolescence. And the very same data analyzed by a group of independent researchers came to the conclusion neither paroxetine nor high dose amipramine showed efficacy in major depression in adolescence, but there was an increase in harms for both. So now what we've got is the first time in history. Uh, two different medical journal articles that come to the opposite conclusions. Now, the reanalysis was exceptional. This isn't usual. If we go to pharmaceutical companies today and we say, well, this trial is suspected of being manipulated, uh, will you hand over the raw data to uh, a group of independent researchers? And the answer is, well, nothing at all. You don't get a reply from them. Uh, so this is one of the most important developments recently, but Dr. Giardini and I argued in our book that we think that uh, the only way of solving this problem is to remove testing from the hands of the pharmaceutical industry. In other words, in or instead of paying um, the high price of an application fee to the FDA to consider a license for the drug, what should be included in that? is a tax on the pharmaceutical and medical device industries to have the testing done by a group of independent researchers, just like the RIAT teams. And once you remove uh, testing from their control, a lot of these problems would disappear. There would be no need to ghostwrite journal articles for uh, the medical journals. Uh, a lot of these medical company, medical communications, it seemed to me, would just dry up. Now, this sounds like something new, but it's not. It was actually introduced by the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, 
uh, in 2004. And you can even find evidence going back to 1907, where the editor of JAMA, George Simons, famously complained about pharmaceutical companies debauching our medical journals. And he stood for a reform campaign that was designed to keep in check the commercialism that threatened to undermine the scientific basis of medicine. So now I come to my conclusions. Uh, how is the integrity of the science protected from commercial influences? More specifically, how is medicine protected from corruption by the pharmaceutical industry? And I think, Adria, you pointed this out in one of your questions, that the source of the problem is political. How is it that we allow this to go on? Protecting science has to be a priority in a capitalist system, but at present it's not because the industry suppresses free critical inquiry, essential, essential to the functioning of science, and it imposes blind product loyalty in its place. Once again, the pharmaceutical industry produces pseudoscience rather than real science because of its failure to subject hypotheses to rigorous criticism. Realizing that the fundamental problem with industry-sponsored trials, evidence-based medicine is turned upside down. Why? Because if your average prescribing doctor recognizes what's really going on with the industry-supported trials, you would recognize that the uh, placebo-controlled trials are the least reliable rather than the most reliable. And therefore, everything gets turned upside down. The prescribing physician now is left with only his own prescribing experience to guide him in, or her with respect to treatment of patients. So with that, I shall conclude. My goodness gracious, what a gift you've given to society, Dr. McHenry. I hope that this goes far and wide. Well, let me ask you a few of the audience questions. In Europe, and granted we have international corporations, in Europe, do they have a different system for approval of uh, pharmaceuticals and dissemination of information to the medical yeah. establishment? Well, good question. Um, in um, our book, we describe the United States as ground zero for the corruption. And it's because a lot of these manipulated trials originate with the kind of emphasis on marketing in the pharmaceutical companies in the United States. But I don't think that, that things are altogether different uh, in, in other countries. The pharmaceutical industry is a global industry and they exert their influence uh, through lobbying, uh, through advertising, using their money to um, uh, fund trials all over the world. Um, so while I think that um, a lot of our attention has been in the United States, mainly because this is where the litigation has been, and this is where we see the documents that have come out of litigation, I suspect that things are not altogether different in Europe. Um, although I have seen some evidence of industry-conducted trials done in Europe that were at least honestly reported. Well, this... What about a adverse, adverse reaction reporting system? I know when it comes to Dr. Uh, Shana Swan spoke to, uh, I think, 10 chemicals in our country, which are not allowed to be in pharmaceuticals or I'm sorry, in cosmetics or things that we bring into the home for cleaning. But apparently in Europe, I think it's called REACH and they have over a hundred chemicals or even more that are not allowed to be in the products that we consume our food products mm. or our, our body products. Is there such a thing in the pharmaceutical industry that has accurate reporting, and I know that's the issue, of adverse effects from pharma or interactions of pharma drugs? Yes. Well, one of the things that I mentioned earlier on was that I participated in the litigation against Monsanto, and that was for uh, the toxic effects of the weed killer Roundup. And for the first time, what I discovered was that the, the corruption has spread from medicine to toxicology, that a lot of these uh, industry-sponsored toxicologists 
are simply doing the bidding for those companies. And the toxicology journals are just as corrupted as the medical journals are. Uh, we've even seen evidence where the peer review system has been corrupted. They, they receive manuscripts that are critical, that expose the toxicity of various chemicals. They go to reviewers who work for the industry. And those reviewers always write negative peer review reports rejecting those manuscripts which are exposing safety signals in toxic chemicals. You know, this is a bit insane because our healthcare budget in the United States is probably in excess of or darn close to our defense budget. And it's going to keep growing. So if we don't have really good pharmaceutical drugs and natural supports of our body's immunity and detoxification systems, yep. That budget's just going to keep going. What's the solution? What is this? What did you call it? Critical yeah. inquiry. What is critical yeah. inquiry? Well, cr critical inquiry is, you know, um, agnotology, what we were talking about before. The, um, you know, uh, certain healthy skepticism with regard to these claims of safety and efficacy in uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, I mean, my own view is that is that we're living on uh, the success of, of uh, pharmaceutical drugs from 20 and 30 years ago. Uh, the drugs that I see that are new and improved, uh, especially when you've got what's called Me Too drugs, which is a, just a slight modification of the mod molecule that they already have a license for, and then they keep uh, modify they, that again and again and again to get a new patent for the drug. Um, it's these drugs that I'm highly skeptical about. Uh, so, so whenever you know you ask, well, what's the bottom line here? I mean, in terms of patients who have to make informed decisions about their treatment, um, th there, there really is no clear, easy answer to this question. Because getting to the source of the of the of the information, which is the data, um, is is it's it's obviously going to remain their intellectual property, and we're always going to have this difficulty. But but my own view again is to be very sort of wary about about claims about efficacy and safety of new drugs when there's already something on the market that has a much better proven record. You know, it's so interesting too, because earlier you said there is a, uh, say an analogy, what's happening with uh, this plant pandemic. And you're talking about information being squashed that might actually question um, the claims of these pharmaceutical drugs. What's fascinating is that there is no different information out there relative to the vaccines and the shots other than what the general media wants to put forward. And I know that there's dissension, uh, disagreement amongst an international outcry actually of doctors and virologists and scientists questioning what the public is being told and they're being taken yep. off the general media too. So it seems like in the arena you're addressing, people are not getting the credibility or they're certainly not getting the exposure from what you just said. If they're questioning what's being put out there and apparently it's the same thing in the paradigm of wanting people to just not have full information of choice on shots and vaccines. Yes. Anyway, um, Dr. But, Henry, go ahead, please. Well, you, you have to keep in mind that the, the, the book that Dr. Giardini and I wrote um, was published just before the pandemic hit. So we really didn't have anything to say. Uh, about that, and now what you're what you're sort of s seeing is, uh, you know, a, a question about these new vaccines. We've got nothing to compare it to, um, and, and and people keep asking me the same question about um, the relevance of what we discovered for the situation we're in now. And you know, the the only sort of answer I have to that question, once again, is 
you know, a healthy skepticism with regard to these, uh, whatever pharmaceutical industries produce. But at the moment, we're in an entirely different sort of situation. We're in an emergency situation. And uh, we don't have a whole lot of choices here. But it's true, I think, that the sort of contrary uh, narratives are being suppressed. And a lot of people who, medical doctors who have important information to convey about this, are, are being shut out of the di- out of the dialogue. Yeah, and once again, that's actually terrifying because we live in the world, a land of free speech. Dr. McHenry, this, and what are the implications of that? This has been absolutely outstanding, amazing, and I am going to close the program right now. I want to thank all of our members, all of our listeners, all of the supporters of the Commonwealth Club. I very much want to thank our incredible staff who has worked hours that you can't believe to bring what was normally an in-person program to a virtual format and to cover all the topics they want to cover to work with to support you and to support the Commonwealth Club. Please remember to listen to our additional programs. We have Dr. Ralph Moss coming up on the 25th of May. He's unbelievable. Sign on for that. He's talking about uh, cancer in a whole different way conquering it with immunotherapy. We have extraordinary programs. Give the gift of the Commonwealth Club. It is the gift that keeps on giving all year long because members have access to free programming. We are very happy to be here. Thank you for being with us. Share Dr. McHenry's podcast far and wide. I'm going to close the program now. Bye now. Bye. Thank you.